Hi everyone. Uh, today I wanted to do a follow-up to my video on taking images under light pollution and really look at it from a different context. So in my previous video, I really focused on using some filters that really focused on the narrow band of light coming in. And that can be really great for targets like nebulas and things like that, but not so good for galaxies. So I wanted to kind of show you guys what I've been doing recently here on the galaxy front uh, under my light polluted suburban Dallas skies. So what we're looking at here is an image of Bode's galaxy and the Cigar galaxy. Uh, this is a single frame taken with my luminance filter. In this case, I was using my, my black and white uh, camera this time, which is the ZWO ASI 1600. And, you know, so I'm still using filters, but the filters I'm using are just to get color uh, and, and that kind of thing. So the luminance filter is just a clear filter. And then I've got a red, a green, a blue. And in this case, I did take some uh, some hydrogen uh, narrowband data to add in later. But you know, really just to look at this to begin with, we're just starting with luminance. So that's just a, a clear filter that's just blocking UV light and infrared light to keep the stars from bloating out on me. And what you can see is not much, right? So this is stretched. So initially, this image, you know, came out almost completely black with a few stars in it. And then even with uh, the auto stretch here in Pix Insight, I can't really see much of the, the Bode's galaxy here. And I can see Cigar all right. That's not bad for a single exposure on that. But a lot of times, you know, when you're under light pollution, this kind of view can be very, very frustrating when you first take it in your camera. And you go, man, I can't get that object. And just like in my previous video, where I was showing that you can use stacking to really bring out the detail, you're still going to want to stack these to do that. The difference is, is that you may not really be able to see in a sub exposure when you're doing these kinds of clear filters or just plain color filters, all the detail that you would want uh, in order to get the best out of it once you stack it. Uh, and the main kind of thing to, to keep in mind here, especially with the newer cameras, if you're looking at this channel, you're probably not using one of the super expensive CCD cameras. You're probably using a CMOS camera, you know, like the ones from ZWO, um, some of the new Attic ones or, or QHYs, those kinds of things. And the thing with those CMOS cameras is they have very little read noise. And what I mean by that let me go ahead and bring up this histogram transformation here. And just to show you guys, you know, you've got your peak of everything that's going on in this image here, all the detail. And the read noise ends up being stuff that would come in behind that. Now, this is already, uh, this image here is a raw frame. And so you see there isn't a whole lot uh, in the back here that is that is contributing to the read noise. It's very low on the read noise front overall. And so what that lets you do is say, well, if the read noise is low, and that's what I get every time I take a picture, then I can actually take shorter exposures because having a lot of them doesn't really hurt me on the read noise front. So if I can take a lot of them, the more of them I use, the better those stacking results are going to get. Now you get kind of diminishing returns, but if you've got hard drive space for it, why not take a lot of shorter exposure images? There's a lot of good reasons for this. A lot of times when you take the longer exposure ones, the first problem that happens is you start noticing your stars aren't round anymore. And that's be, you know, a lot of times either because of your polar alignment or your tracking mount. And so people, and even me included, will spend a lot of money on a mount that's, that's a lot more high-end just to get rounder stars. Well, the shorter your exposure, the less deformed your stars are going to get with those tracking errors. So 
that's a one good reason to use shorter exposures. Another good reason is, you know, if you live in a suburban area like I do, you may have a lot of issues with, say, like planes flying overhead. If you're going to take a two or three or five minute long exposure and a plane flies through it, well, that's two or three or five minutes you wasted. If you're taking, you know, a 30 second exposure like this was here and it flies through, you've only lost 30 seconds. So you can really make the most out of your imaging time by not having to throw away as many sub exposures. So that's all great, you know, sounds awesome in theory, you know, what can I, but you know, as I see, I, I'm not seeing much here, you know, I, it's, it's really pretty bad, you know, and, and if I'm not exposing for a long time, especially under light pollution, right? How am I possibly going to get a good image at the end of the day? So I'll show you what, uh, what I did in terms of number of exposures here. You know, just looking at uh, kind of the initial data set here, highlight up here so you can see, I've got a ton of exposures that came through on this. This is 270 actual images here. Um, you know, and if you look, they're all 60 seconds or 30 seconds that came in. And if you look, I actually did this on a couple of nights together. Um, the first night was actually just hydrogen alpha ones. And then the second, you know, these two nights I did a little bit more in other, other ways. So at the end of the day, once I look at how many I had, uh, calibrated here, you know, looking at my 60 second exposures, I ended up with 600 of them overall, and they're broken down by the different filters, right? So that's a lot of time for sure. And you, you have to spend a lot of time if you're going to go kind of unfiltered in a light polluted sky. But what does that get for you at the end of the day? Well, what that ended up with for me was this image here. So, you know, I've had many people ask me, you know, what dark sky site did I go to to take this image? And I didn't. I took this from the backyard. Um, and in actually, this was actually under a mostly uh, close to full moon. I think it was like a three quarters uh, or more moon. Um, so, you know, obviously a lot more detail in there than this single luminance image. When I started working with this and really stacked the luminance image together and then worked with it, I was able to come up with this here. So just scrolling in here, a lot of detail came out and these exposures did not get any bigger or longer than what I originally had here, right? It's really just a matter of the amount of time spent in total of exposures. So if I was doing, say, a five minute long exposure, I'm instead of having 600 of them, right, I you know, would have had far less, you know, I would have had, you know, like 100 of them, but, uh, or even less than that. But there's a, a few additional problems that come with that beyond even just the, the plane flying through and things like that. The other side is, is clipping you know a lot of these CMOS cameras uh, they don't have they can't gather as much light in a particular pixel so something like the bright core of this galaxy which in my original image was one of the few things I could see instead of being something where I don't really even I barely can make out a little fuzzy of where that was in the original image unstretched here it might actually be blown out to the point where no matter what I did in processing here, it would just be too bright and I'd never be able to, to get a really good resulting final kind of contrast from one side to the other without this feeling too blown out. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm starting to have a little bit of that issue even with the Cigar Galaxy at, at 30 second exposures. So those CMOS cameras don't go as deep uh, in terms of how many pixels per, or how many uh, uh, photons per pixel they can pick up. Um, but also with that lower read noise, it just allows you to kind of be more flexible with it. So 
like I said, this was a fairly uh, bright, you know, kind of week of, of heavy moon. And I set this up to record over a few evenings. Maybe I didn't need to go as deep as I ended up going with it. It was kind of an experiment to see. Um, you know, maybe half the time would have still resulted in, a, in an image that was, was pretty great. Um, but, you know, for me, I'm extra super happy with how this one turned out. And it just goes to show that even without getting extra super fancy filters, right, it really can come down to finding out the right kind of exposure for your camera and, and honestly having a little bit of faith. Uh, because as I said, when you look at this, if I looked at this early on in, in kind of my imaging days and I saw this coming out, I would have said, oh, I didn't get it. You know, even if even if I auto stretch this right in an application right after I took the image and saw this, I would say, oh, I only barely got the galaxy. I guess I'm going to have to take a longer exposure and I would have exposed more and more and more. And what would have happened at the end is that once I did stack these and tried to stretch them, I would find that it that it was overexposed. There was so much noise. I wouldn't be able to separate what I wanted to see from the rest of the background. So, you know, have some faith that if you take the right number of images, it's going to end up working out so long as you follow some rules of thumb for your camera and your telescope. And you can kind of look up online just by searching for ideal exposure times um, for your camera. So in my case, I have a ZWO ASI 1600 mm and i'm going to say ideal exposure time or times and right from there you get a lot of different things here um and so i would read through those and you can you can kind of find those uh for for each camera that you have um, there's some specific math on that some programs like sharp cap have a sensor analysis tool that can really help you figure out uh, exactly which kind of time frame will work for you um, for me uh, i found that in my particular light pollution levels which are, are fairly high uh, anything over um, or anything that i'm taking uh, really 30 seconds is about the lowest that I'd probably want to go um, for the usual gain settings that I want to go. Um, and honestly, anything over that's just gravy until I start clipping. So as long as you've got the hard drive space for it, which I do, uh, I may as well take the shortest exposure one. That's going to give you the most dynamic range at the end of the day. And then the real difference is, is when you come in here and you are going to uh, you know, stack those images, you're gonna press that stack button and then it'll take it longer. It, it just will, it'll take a while longer to go through all those photos. Uh, but I just kind of got up and walked away with it. So just to show you at the end here, as I mentioned before, this was the original uh, luminance data just through that filter. The red came out like this. You can see my flats didn't even quite catch everything on some of these. My green my blue, and then my hydrogen alpha, which actually ended up a little bit underexposed for what I, I should have been doing here uh, since I've done the math at the end of the day. But uh, but then after that, um, you know, standard kind of processing along with, um, you know, the, the RGB combination or channel combination, and then finally the uh, narrow band uh, channel combination to get to the final image here. So I'll bring this back out to the total one. This is cropped in just a little bit, uh, but this can, you know, hopefully give you guys some encouragement that you can get there. Um, this does not have to be the best scope in the world. This this configuration I think was the F5 uh, setup for me, if I remember correctly, which is not crazy slow. It's not crazy fast. Um, you know, it's a, it's a good middle ground that a lot of people have on their, their medium size refractors. Um, and so, you know, you really just gotta, gotta kind of set it up and let it run. Um, and what'll happen with these targets, don't be afraid to do them over a couple of nights. You know, if you have, um, you know, 
if you're like me and you kind of want to want to take pictures of multiple targets, that's fine. Um, what I've done is because my my telescope using Sequence Generator Pro can kind of move to the next target and take pictures even when I'm not there. Um, typically, what I've done is I've decided a target for the beginning of the evening and a target for the middle and end of the evening. So in this case, this was the you know 1 a.m. to 4 a.m. target over a couple of nights, and I had a nebula. I think it was the Orion Nebula uh, or, or uh, um, Orion's Belt area that I was taking pictures of between 10 p.m. and midnight. Um, and that can be a good way to kind of break things up so that you can maybe use the first part of the night to really take some quick, fun pictures just to, to really be observing more than anything else. And then set your sights on something up uh, that's in that latter half of the night. When you're under light pollution, a lot of times the 10 p.m. to midnight or 1 really isn't your prime time anyways. It's that 1 to 4 a.m. when everybody's asleep and the most number of lights are going to be turned off around your neighborhood and, and around the city around you uh, that you get the best clear skies. So I hope that was helpful uh, to you guys. Um, you know, I'll leave you at the end here with just the actual full size of the export of this image here uh, so that you can see it a little bit better. But I, uh, I hope this was helpful. I hope it was encouraging. Um, and we'll see you next time. And until then, I wish everybody clear skies. Thanks.